Welcome to RCR Wireless here at CES 2014. Alan Moore Schaffin, and with me is Mike Hopkins from Imagination. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you very much, and welcome to Imagination. Thank you. So we are in their booth here at the show floor on the in the South Hall, and you have this amazing array of things for us to look at. It's very exciting. First, start us off. Tell us a little bit about te Imagination Technologies. Okay, well, Imagination was started as a company called Videologic in 1985. What we found when we moved to around 2000 is that we took our graphics uh, IP and we integrated that into the chipset that went into the Sega Dreamcast. What we then found is we had a business model to license technology to chipset manufacturers who then built that into a range of different products. So we've grown from that point uh, to today where we now have over 5 billion devices have been shipped into the markets on many different uh, platforms from TVs, radio, set-top boxes, mobile phones, gaming devices, you name it, it's got our IP inside. And we have a wide range of IP now that supports many, many different market applications. And explain a little bit more the layers of how your IP gets into it, so if you could just explain to everyone so they understand that. Okay, so what we do is we have a, a block, um, so if you take a, a, a system on chip like an Intel Atom chip, that will have an Intel processor inside there. What they do is inside that single chip they integrate our graphics IP, so they take our graphics IP and put that into the silicon that goes onto the chip. And then also alongside that they may take our video IP and put that into the same chip. So they have a full sort of multimedia SOC solution for many different applications. And what you do is you license the technology, so um, can you tell us a little bit about the kinds of relationships that you have with the different companies? Okay, so essentially as a licensee we talk to a lot of the semiconductor manufacturers and there's well over 30 top flight sort of uh, semiconductor manufacturers that use our technology. So we work closely with them to actually produce the silicon chip itself. What we then do is we build up an ecosystem where we will talk to the actual manufacturers of the equipment, whether it's a mobile phone manufacturer or a TV manufacturer, so that when they integrate the chip they actually get the best integration on a platform level. We then extend the ecosystem to developers, so if someone wants to write an application for a mobile phone, we can actually support them with tools and equipment so they can write a, a, an application maybe for a, a, an, a, an Android mobile phone as an example. Wonderful. Well, here we have a full ecosystem being shown to us right here. And here on the wall, we're seeing the products, the final products. Let me stand over here actually a little bit. And so what are we looking at right here? So what, what we have is a range of different devices that use our IP. So our processor technology is actually driving the TV that, set that you see there. It's also in the media player that you see underneath it. Inside all of the speakers and the radios, we have our communications IP and our processor IP. And other devices will have graphics IP incorporated in there. So now let's take a look at this other ecosystem that you really are breaking down how all the IP is showing up and along the way. So let's take a look at that. Okay. So now here, this is the beginning of the ecosystem, or at least I like to see it at the beginning of the building blocks of this ecosystem. And it's vision-oriented, so it's the, the process of the chips that are vision-oriented. Can you describe them a little bit to us? Yeah, certainly. I mean, what, what do you find if you take a, a small camera module, um, you have a, a camera sensor, um, you then need to process that data and then stream it um, and then encode it. So if, you, if you're taking maybe a video or a JPEG still image, you need to then process that. But at the front end of the camera, from the sensor itself, you've got raw data. So what we've developed is our Raptor ISP, which is our vision ISP, which essentially sits right behind the sensor and allows you to actually efficiently take the data from the sensor and then start to transfer that down the camera pipeline. So what we have over here is a, a camera um, that's running. It's taking the raw data from the camera interface, putting that through into our FPGA, which is then processing that image, and then sending an RGB image of that to, uh, to a screen. And we're showing how each step here along the way is being covered, actually, by Ex what you're offering. Exactly. So effectively, the IP that we produce at Imagination allows us to go right the way from the image sensor right the way through to the screen. The stage that follows the sensor is actually the video encoding. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is a well-established video encoding technology. Mm -hmm. um, and what, this, what we've focused on with our video encoder is to get the best possible performance. Mm -hmm. So in the demonstration that you can see in the background, what we're doing is we're actually comparing our capabilities at the same bit rate 
to someone else. And what we find is that we can actually get much better quality. What this means in reality is that if you have a mobile phone with our video ENCO technology and you take a video and you want to upload that maybe to a social networking network uh, site, you can actually, for the same quality, have lower bit rate. Mm -hmm. So it means it costs you less and also takes less storage to transmit that same quality image. So are you actually putting sort of more pixels in? Are you, is it a compression thing? What is? What are you doing? It's, it's really the quality. So what you do is in, in terms of resolving the image and then compressing that down into the best possible format. So within the constraints of maybe if you take a stream like MPEG-2 for instance or H.264, um, what you need to do is to, it's the efficiency at which you can compress that which then gives you the lower bandwidth at the same sort of visual quality. So your secret sauce is the compression? I, it, it's, it's compression and a number of sort of processing algorithms rhythms that are all integrated within the hardware IP itself. Okay. okay, so now we're looking at the decoder. Let's look at that. Okay, so with the decoder, we've had the decoder in the market for a long time, and we've actually shipped over 720 million devices into the market with our video technology inside. What we're now looking at is the ability to do full HEVC 4K or Ultra HD decoding, and we can actually now cope with data streams up to 100 and 120 megabits per second. All of this 2K, 4K decoding um, in uh, sort of full 30 to 60 frames per second and then running with full 10-bit color resolution. So what we see on the demonstration here is actually an FPGA. Um, the reason that the image is very slow and not moving is that the FPGA and the limits of the FPGA is not sufficient to actually show this in real time. The actual core technology itself which is already being integrated into new chips, um, is capable of sort of very high resolution, very high performance, high bit rate, and high color content. Okay, and so the this is decoding, and I guess I keep on wondering about your competition and what makes you so different from everyone else. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I don't believe there's anyone else that can do the full 10-bit sort of decoding in the same efficiency levels that we have. Um, so again, it's sort of looking at sort of very high resolution, high bit rate, and also sort of looking at sort of uh, high performance. And it's really focusing on getting the optimum performance, which then creates a more efficient system. Which is important given the fact that we have so many 4K and 2Ks coming out. I mean, that's, the, that's what everyone's talking about on the show floor. So now we have our last thing is the graphics area, right? So let's talk about this. So what we're showing here is our latest sort of graphics IP, and we license this to customers like MediaTek and AllWinner. Um, what we've done is we've actually sort of uh, enhanced the overall performance to optimize the performance of the graphics to give high-end performance, but also offer solutions for the sort of lower-end devices as well. So what we have here is we have devices from MediaTek and also from uh, AllWinner. And some of the techniques that you can do to create more efficient systems um, is we can use OpenGL ES 3.0 to create more efficient so you get much better graphics performance on a mobile device. And what we're looking at is getting to console quality graphics but on a mobile device. So you're working at maybe 1 50th of the power consumption of a console but actually offering equivalent or similar levels of performance and certainly equivalent sort of user experiences. So what we can do is, as we've developed more powerful chips, is you can actually start to use the graphics processor for non-graphics purposes. So here what we're showing is a demonstration where you can actually change and do image processing, uh, both on still images and also over here on a, a live video stream. So you can do image enhancement in real time. And what we've actually found is it can actually sort of improve the overall system performance. So using the GPU, we can actually quadruple the performance at half the power consumption as opposed to doing that on a computer on a CPU in a different mode. So finally, as we look forward to the future of graphics, what we have over here is ray tracing. So ray tracing actually uses the physics of light to create a photorealistic image. So the plane that you see here is actually a computer model that uses light to actually generate all of the reflections and shadows to make that look photorealistic. And what we expect to see is that coming through into the mobile space over the next maybe three to four years or four to five years. And this will enhance not only the gaming experiences, so it will allow you to, if you imagine the film Avatar, for instance, you could create a game that will make you feel like that you're actually inside the film. So these chips and these software is uh, very powerful. 
it's extremely powerful and it also opens up lots of new opportunities. So if you integrate ray tracing into mobile space and tablet devices, you can do things like augmented reality. So if you're doing online shopping, you could actually get a photorealistic product downloaded from the internet to your phone and display that over a video image or over a camera image so you can actually see what a new product would look like in your own home. Now, how does your chips and your graphics chips particularly, how do they compare to NVIDIA's, let's say, specifically NVIDIA's new launch that it's, it's releasing today? Well, what we've done at Imagination is the whole focus has been building up low power and high performance, and we focused initially on the mobile market. So what we found is the graphics processors are very easy to scale up. So what we can do is we can actually scale up and achieve very, very high levels of performance using our graphics IP, but at very low power at the same time. So we don't have the same constraints of taking high-powered systems and then trying to constrain them for the mobile market. So we've actually found that it's easier to increase your graphics performance from the mobile space and then use sort of uh, different sort of parallel architectures to increase that to give the performance for high-level systems. And how does it affect also maybe your price point or anything like that if you're following that methodology of development? Well, again, at the same time, as in the same way we can scale up, we can also scale down to offer features that give the benefits of the high-level graphics performance, um, but we can actually sort of take out certain features that might not be needed for a low-cost solution, so we can actually fully support low-cost integration of our graphics IP. So basically, you're saying you're uh, lower power and you're also lower cost than what we might be seeing from NVIDIA. Exactly, and, and we can perform as uh, the same higher level as well, or higher level, to be honest with you. Right. Well, let's like look at another part of the ecosystem. So what we're looking at here is an integration of the MIPS architecture um, in Android tablets. And we're actually fully integrated into the Google, into the Android build chain. So when you actually compile any application now, it will automatically generate a version for the MIPS processor core. It also means that the MIPS devices or MIPS-based devices will fully support any applications that are available for download on the Google Play Store. So MIPS as an architecture is fully integrated into Android, and that's where we're seeing things going from MIPS processors going into Android TVs, Android set-top boxes, as well as phones and tablet devices. And how about Apple and Microsoft OS? Uh, so in terms of Apple have their own chips and their own operating system, um, Microsoft, we could potentially support that. So as an architecture, um, we can support any operating system potentially on our architecture. So there's no problem with, uh, with supporting other high-level operating systems. And I can't recall if we actually covered this already, but the, with regard to the 64-bit, is this a 64-bit processor or is it? Um, this processor itself is a 30-bit. To 32 bit processor, but in actual fact, we've actually had 64 bit architecture as part of the MIPS architecture core for many, many years, decades now in reality. And the benefit of the MIPS architecture is that we can actually scale right the way through from our sort of low end microcontrollers right through to the highest end 64 bit processors that you would care to produce and use the same instruction set across all devices. So, in terms of porting and scalability, we actually have the full ability to both port software and then scale it across different core uh, implementations. Great, let's take a look at the cloud now. So now we're at the next stage of this ecosystem, it deals with the communications part. What do you tell us about that? Okay, so what we have is we have a hardware IP block, which is our Insigma core. That's the radio processor unit. If you look at any communication system, you come from an antenna into the tuner. The next level beyond the tuner is a demodulator or a modulator. Now that changes depending on any standard that you have. So if you take a TV, for instance, and you sell that into the US market, it will use an ATSC standard. If you ship that into Japan, it will use ISDBT or into Europe DVBT. Now each of those require a different demodulator, but with a radio processor unit, you can actually reprogram the device to cope with any of the worldwide standards. Now what we can do is then extend that beyond just broadcast, we can actually do communications. So we can actually use the same core to do Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Zigbee and anything else. So we on the same core can support up to 802.11 AC, right the way through to digital TV broadcast or even FM radio on the same core. 
So it's just a matter of what you're choosing to use and it's just simply programming accordingly. Exactly. So when you combine the communications with the processor side, you actually then have a connected processor and that's the fundamental building blocks for the Internet of Things. Um, what you then need to do is to actually then incorporate that with a cloud service because how does my watch, for instance, my smartwatch talk to my phone or talk to a radio unit or stream content from another source. It has to go through an internet channel. And this is where we developed Flow. So Flow essentially is a, is a, is a cloud service um, that allows connected devices to communicate with each other. And what we do is we license this out as an IP. So as an example, Pure have an audio service, so you can stream audio, you can select different digital radio stations, stream that over the internet, you can source content and download it to a different device, and they use the Flow server. The example that we've got here is actually where we take the same chips that is used in a digital radio radio and we've implemented that into a, a power block for a utility company. So as an example, you could remote control your lighting system at your home lighting or indeed your utility company could actually monitor your energy uses or even control that so they actually make their whole system much more power efficient. Fantastic. So just to, just to review so everyone understands, you're offering this entire ecosystem and now you have the cloud service. So a company that wants to offer different hardware devices, how it wants to offer, have create a whole offering for the consumer, they would license this technology from you. They would license, in fact, the rights to use the cloud and they would just package it, brand it with their own brand and bring it out to the consumer marketplace. Exactly. I mean, what we found is that people that, I mean, if you take, say, a medical device, you might have a heart rate monitor talking to a phone that talks to a medical server. Now a guy that produces a heart rate monitor doesn't understand how to build up a full cloud service. So we can actually offer that to them as an ability to create a complete end-to-end -end solution using our IP. Great, wonderful. This is fantastic. So now let's talk about VoIP. Let's complete the communications round. So what we've now developed is again using the Flow service is a full voice and video over IP solution. So what this allows you to do is to build up applications on many different devices. So if I wanted to use a voice over IP on a smartwatch, I can actually integrate that as an Android application on top of my smartwatch. But what we've done within uh, Imagination is to actually create the full complete sort of end-to-end -end solution so we can do voice and video and where we have accelerated sort of IP such as our video IP we can use that to accelerate the video process and make that more efficient so from a consumer aspect they get better quality with lower power consumption and here we have actually a product reflection of the entire ecosystem we've just been discussing. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that's correct. I mean, this is just a small selection of some of the five billion devices that we've shipped. Um, but it's just to give an example of the, the fact that we've got technology now going into TVs, set-top boxes, radio systems, handheld devices, tablets, and everything else. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things from our side, we've just seen the imagination technology is going into so many different products. Um, it, we can create a whole home and a whole home ecosystem from devices with our IP inside. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing all this great information with us. And thank you very much for coming. And thank you for joining us here at CES 2014. Stay tuned for more from the show floor.